Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us Siddharth Roy, and he is reporting from Bali on what is happening on the first day of the G20 summit. Siddharth, we had a discussion yesterday and you said that the hopes of a successful Bali are pretty dim. We had a meeting with President Biden and President Xi. And the question is, did you see something coming out of it or was it just the saying that we will now agree to disagree and we will at least keep the communications open, which had actually snapped after uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. So just to keep it limited to the meeting between President Biden and uh, Xi Jinping, that's a positive, most certainly a positive in the limited scope that we uh, then coming out of the meeting and uh, saying that, no, there is no threat of an imminent war is great especially in our times when we already have one war going on. And uh, the truth is that uh, neither does the world need another war, nor can the U.S. taxpayers afford another one. So good for everyone that they've come out with a statement. But uh, so this is a negation, a partial negation of, you know, uh, uh, us feeling the that it's, it's all hope lost. But yet it's not all hopes up either. I uh, interviewed uh, the U.S. spokesperson and I actually asked him that, how is it that you decided that you're okay talking to Xi Jinping, with whom uh, you had a massive standoff, but why would you not repeat the same thing with Russia? But uh, even then, if, if you go through the interview, it doesn't really give us a pointed answer. So no, we don't really see that. Uh, there's like a continuance of hope from Biden Xi meeting. Also, importantly, the list of bilateral meetings which Narendra Modi will be having, that's out. Uh, anybody on social media could check it. The list does not include a bilateral meeting with the US nor with China at the moment. So, uh, we've already been, India's already has whatever good relations with the France and uh, UK and whatever. Now, the two main players outside of India, the two main players of the G20, uh, China and US, why aren't they talking to India? That's a question to be asked. If there has really been a thaw and things are all hunky-dory, why is there no bilateral talk? So now I'm not pinning my hopes or to, to the extent that I would like. Well, even with the President Biden and Xi's meeting, the interesting part of it is the techno war, the technical war, the chip war are not discussed. The financial wars are not discussed. All they have really said, well, Taiwan doesn't seem to be heading for a war right now. And we have started to discuss other bilateral issues. So a resumption of normal talking and not really anything more than that, which had snapped with the Pelosi visit. So that seems to be the positive. Yes, any positive in today's world is a positive. So let's be uh, thankful for small mercy, so to say. But the other part of it, and I had a discussion with Ambassador Bhadra Kumar last night. He said G20 was formed to be essentially a place where countries could come together, major economies could come together, and it was formed really in 2007-2008 crisis. When G7 thought that they could they could involve others and there would be a global consensus led by the G20. Now that period seems to be over. They don't see G20 as a platform. And whatever decisions they need to take regarding the global issues, they seem to be thinking about only G7. So both on Ukraine and on China, Taiwan issues, we of course do not see any negotiations take place in China, Taiwan and US. There is a discussions have started which had snapped completely. But nevertheless, on chip war, which is the, the tech war between China and the United States, nothing really came out of the Biden Xi meeting. And Ukraine is not on the agenda very clearly in G20. Is that what you get from what you are hearing? Is anybody willing to take an initiative which they think might have some traction? Uh, on Ukraine, no. Like, I've heard nothing being mentioned about Ukraine. There are general statements, which is, uh, which is, which is only goes to the maximum extent of saying, 
oh, people should talk, there shouldn't be war. But anything concrete about it, no. So neither any talk about NATO and Russia, no discussion on that, or on the issue about energy war, which is the other war which is going on against Russia. In fact, the oil price, the bar that is supposed to be, that there is going to be an upper bar beyond which they can't sell. And India is on the firing line on that one, saying that you guys are violating buying Russian oil and so on. And that on those issues, we don't seem to see G20 as any platform for trying to bring about a better uh, atmosphere in terms of war and the economy. Because the economies of countries are getting hit by the economic war, which one hand is taking place between NATO, European Union, United States, and Russia. On the other hand, the techno technical war, the chip wars, also the trade war between the United States and China. On those fronts, you don't see G20 being able to take any initiative. Is that what you... Really well, are? to be... Uh, the best way to put this would be that yesterday, when I made my points, I said that the entire G20 cannot be all about Russia and Ukraine. But that doesn't mean that there uh, need not be absolutely any mention of it. Uh, the reason being that in trying to, you know, uh, get around that blockade, which is laudable, let's get around what we can't and let's achieve what we can. But is it, uh, is it as, as simple as that? Perhaps not. We don't see a single mention of Russia holding a bilateral talk with anybody. At least nothing is out there um, in, the, in the open press. So uh, the question is, it's, it's still a question uh, that has Russia been completely isolated at G20? I'm not so sure if that's true. But does it, to answer your question, does it undermine the authority of G20 if it comes to things like this? By all means, yes. Like, even if not India and uh, um, Indonesia, are, is the G20 really going to survive without a Russia in it? Is the UN, UN Security Council going to survive uh, with any authority or any respect without a Russia in it? What are we going to do there? So you cannot go from, like, making everything about Russia and Ukraine to uh, completely not mentioning Russia and having a complete blackout. So we are at a catch-22 here. Uh, or rather, actually, we are at a... Uh, at, a, at a proffering from the West, which is two extreme binaries. Uh, we can have neither of these. Also, the interesting part is what is the role G20 now plays? It came into being at the time of the economic crisis that the leading players in the world should get together, meet, and have the negotiations of what can or cannot be done. So a quasi-informal platform, formal platform, if you will, which allows for bilaterals, other, other initiatives being taken, not committing like you would do the United Security Council resolutions, but in terms of how to go about the future. It does seem that G20 now shows that that kind of space is no longer there. The idea of G20 was, of course, the G7 or the United States will hegemonize the world and G20 will fall in line with G7. Now, that's not happening because you have Russia, you have China, and you have India and a whole bunch of other players. If you take G20, for instance, G7 is actually isolated on the question of Russia sanctions or on the question of even China, economic war on China, in which even Germany is now uh, tr trying to break ranks that you, know, you cannot really isolate China economically. Then our industry is also going to collapse. No energy from Russia, no industrial tie-up with China in terms of markets. We are going to be in a, in a soup. So given all of that, G20 is no longer the place in which these discussions are going to take place. That seems to be the sense that from what you were saying. And this is... No, what let's, be let's be a little hopeful. Let's be a little hopeful as well by saying that you, 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 you touched a good point, saying that maybe in trying to isolate Russia... The U.S. is getting isolated, which could very well be the uh, likely outcome of uh, this setup, because it's not that India isn't holding talks with other countries or the other countries aren't talking among themselves. I mean, Germany, Spain, 
several members, France, several members of the European Union are going to hold bilateral talks with India and with others, <clears throat> including the other BRICS nations. So uh, maybe uh, the G20, whether it survives or not, is, is it's too early for us to take a call. Uh, uh, but maybe we'll see many fractals inside this bigger group. Maybe there will be trade zones established. Maybe there will be individual trade agreements established. So, uh, in a sense, this is really throwing uh, the arena open. And by all means, by all means, there is a not so subtle snubbing of America being the principal shepherd of this entire uh, program. If you really see the continuity between ASEAN, COP, and this, and you listen to uh, India's statements for that matter, they have yielded zero ground when it comes to energy. They said, they've said that, sorry, uh, we are not going to compromise our energy security in, in, in any way uh, because we want to be validated by uh, whoever else, the US or their allies. And that's the same thing with Germany. Yeah, I, I think what you were saying is true that the G20 may not reach any conclusion, but the bilaterals and the trilaterals, the smaller groups meeting, could show that G20 is not going to be hegemonized by any country. And therefore, a more multilateral world is now coming into being. And it is not going to be shepherded by either the United States or its allies, which is really the G7, which, as I think the new statements had once called the White Boys Club, the ex-colonial states and the settler colonial states deciding the future of the world. I think that's one of the takeaways. What will be the I, nature? I, I hear Prabhida, you've actually used two words which are uh, very crucial. Here. Yeah. Uh, settler and colonial. You see, the White Boys Club, as you characterize, as you very rightly characterize the G7, because they do embody, irrespective of the genderedness of the word boys, they actually do uh, embody the spirit of the white boys club globally at the moment. Maybe this is a maybe this G20 will be a time for them to come to terms with the reality that look, you guys are the feudal lords of a feudal era that's past. Uh, the rest of the world hasn't really gotten much from you, uh, firstly. And the big change is that now maybe they aren't waiting for too much from you when it comes to their own energy needs, their industry needs, their employment, their economy, their climate issues, and so on and so forth. That's a very important point. And if you look at the map, which we have, you will see large parts of the world, it's not G7, it's really G20. And even in G20, you see Africa is missing except only South Africa. Of course, in the White Boys Club, you also have Japan who were considered, even in South Africa, apartheid times, uh, as honorary whites. And they, of course, yes, identified yes. themselves with the settler colonial states as well. They just wanted their colonies. So given this, I think what we are seeing is that the hegemony of G7, which emerged really after the fall of Soviet Union and the US becoming the sole hegemon, in which first Russia is G8 and then G20, that sort of being turned back. And there is the attempt to of G7 trying to hegemonize, which according to what you're seeing on the ground, is not succeeding in G20. And you've also brought up the COP27, that that is not, that's also not going too well for them over there. So I think a new world order emerging, hopefully, out of the ashes of the Ukraine war, hopefully, that it will lead to a more equal political partnership between countries. And hopefully, again, we hope that Ukraine war, the economic war on China, the economic war on Russia can come to a resolution with peaceful settlement of all these issues. When, how, we have to see how that goes. Another very important uh, point, uh towards, you know, the breaking up of the hegemony of the U.S. and its Western allies, uh, and perhaps the G20 getting reorganized along uh, different axes, is the fact that uh, uh, the Chinese Premier has uh, uh, sounded support for the African Union to get a seat at the G20. Now, if, now, now consider 
that approach versus the West, which is completely uh, blind, willfully blind to the African Union's demand. If China, for whatever reasons, you know, we do know China has massive investments in Africa, even if it is driven by that narrow goal, if China were to really back the African Union to get a seat at the G20, that would be yet another brownie point lost for the West, which is always tom toming diversity and inclusiveness. But we see very little of it actually being implemented. Thank you, Siddharth, for being with us, going through these issues, very complex issues in a quick changing world. I think the world is reaching some kind of a really inflection point at the moment. And this year seems to be the year in which we will see this unfold. Let's hope the future will bring about settlements of some of the outstanding issues and hopefully a more equal and a less hegemonic world order. Thanks for being with us. We'll be in touch and hope that we'll get updates from you tomorrow about what happens finally in Bali. And behind me, you'll see that Bali streets are chock a block with traffic because this is too small an island for such big power plays and the powerful and the security convoys. Thank you, Siddharth. We'll be with you tomorrow as well. That's all the time Thanks. we have in News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and also our follow-ups on Bali.